China is unique in that it fits into a rather narrow category, but that's because there aren't many candidates. States which, before belatedly becoming nation states, were for a long time civilization states for a simple reason, which is that uh, for a long time they have been on a scale that is far superior than what I call standard size states, which is to say, roughly speaking, the average over a historianomic cycle, the average of state size. So let me remind you, if we're talking about the Bronze Age cycle, i.e. around uh, 2600 BC, 1100 BC, the standard scale of states is very small cities. The palatial civilization of Crete, for example, for antiquity, that is, from 2100 BC to 500 AD, more or less. These are the city-states, in particular all the Greek cities, Rome and so on. And finally, in the modern era, uh, i.e. the modern cycle, which begins in 500 AD and continues to the present day, and which has not yet ended. We're talking about territorial states, the size of those found in Europe, for example, i.e. France, Germany, and so on. That's the standard. So the standard evolves over time. It tends to go from strength to strength. These are very ancient, very ancient states that very quickly became had a dimension that was far superior to that of the standard states. So best examples, best examples in any case, you have, for example, Egypt. Egypt, Egypt, a unified state since before revolution at 2500 BC. The dimensions of the state, similar to today's Egypt, may be slightly larger. In other words, it's a state that is similar to a state that is similar to a state. It's a state that's considerably larger in size than the civilizations of the Bronze Age. Once again, as I said, it's the Minoan and Mycenaean palaces. Minoan and Mycenaean palaces, for example, or the great cities of the Middle East, Marie, Ugarit, Ursakad, etc. So, uh, Egypt was huge for a long time, but only became a nation state in the modern era because it remained as such for a very long time. Remained a territorial state, a state, in fact, civilization. It brought together all its civilization and began to become a nation state once it was integrated into the much wider civilizational ensemble of the Arab Muslim world, within which it gradually distinguished itself to become a nation state. I refer you to the program I did on the historionomy of the Arab world, but then states, they have not always been nation states because they simply straddle cycles. And so the big states that straddle historionomic cycles like this, there's usually a cycle where they're well above the average size of standard states, and then they, they enter the standard eventually. And it's once they're in the standard that they can become a nation state. And why is that because a nation state is a state which by definition is opposed to the otherness of other standard states. That's what makes this kind of thing possible. And that's why we can consider Greek city-states such as Sparta, Thebes and so on to have been nation states. Because we often think of city-states in opposition, but in reality you can't oppose city-states to the nation state. The city-state can be contrasted with the territorial state, a vast state that brings together several cities within its bosom. But a city-state can be a nation state, can have a national consciousness. You even still have one today. In Singapore, for example. So, uh, apart from Egypt, there are other cases. There's Persia, for example, which was also a very large empire in antiquity, not since the Bronze Age, but in antiquity, uh, and which then became a nation in the modern era. That's Iran. And finally, there's China. China, which for a very long time, as we shall see, was an empire, and which only really began to become a nation state in modern times, that is, when it found itself confronted by uh, otherness, state equivalent to them, which it had never known since it had always been, as we shall see, the middle empire, the one with absolutely no equals, i.e. the big empire, and around it there are only small entities that are vassals, possibly very distant empires like the Roman Empire. There were no confrontations to really create otherness. And above all, you have places where you can have two empires that will be in contact. Even that's not enough. Even that's not enough. Need more entities for real otherness? To truly comprehend being part of a larger whole, there must be more than two entities at that level, like the Roman and Sassanid empires who lacked a sense of national identity, except perhaps a little in their very last confrontation between the Byzantines and the Persians. I'm not going to get lost here, but let's say that, uh, roughly speaking, no. In other words, you've only got two empires, each of which sees itself as a rival. If you start to have three or four empires, then you can have the birth of nation states. And so China was able to make this transition by being confronted with an otherness uh, uh, from the moment it was confronted in the modern era from the 19th century onwards uh, with the otherness of very large neighboring states like the Russian Empire and the British Empire in particular, and then the Empire of Japan, 
which meant that it was truly surrounded and that enabled it to complete its transformation into a nation state. And the other condition, as you know, and this is what I regularly explain, is that uh, apart from that, a nation state is also a form of empire that lives on. In other words, it's an imperial state that remains within clear borders long enough for homogenization to take place so that it ceases to think of itself as an empire, but the entire population belong to the imperial identity. In other words, there would no longer be an imperial core and vassals, but the whole would have a certain homogeneity. And therefore, this homogeneity only comes about over time, but also, and I'll come back to this point, through confrontation with anotherness that shows that you can't be homogeneous with everyone. These are the two conditions that give rise to the nation state. So China is one of those great states like Persia or Egypt. I can't think of many others because there are no other empires of this size. Maybe India could have been. One day we'll do a historiognomy of India. We'll talk about it, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. So what we need to say at the outset is that China is a special model. And that's what we're going to look at over the long term simply by going back over the history of China, China's history. Let's start with maps because we have maps. You like maps. I like maps. We're cartophiles. So we'll start there. So uh, the state history, uh, we'll say, of China really begins in 2000 BC. Uh, well, in 2000 BC, let's say, at the beginning of the second millennium BC, to be exact, since naturally there isn't a date with a stamp at that point. It began with uh, the appearance of the very first around naturally a dynasty that is the Xia dynasty of Xia, this dynasty was the first semblance of a state or at least the equivalent of what we could see as a state in Sumer or the Indus Valley, in other words, the embryo of one. Before that, there were already traces of natural cultural development, what we called the Longshan culture. I haven't spent enough time on it to talk about it at length, but there you have it. But here goes. So the first appearance is this Xia dynasty, which would have been the first of the three dynasties. There are three great dynasties that the Chinese talk about, the Xia, the Shang, and the Zhou, which are the ancient dynasties that for a long time were considered almost mythical since it was well before the unification of the country by the Han, as we'll come back to. And through archaeological research, we're discovering traces linked to the Han dynasty from these three dynasties. Gradually, these somewhat legendary periodicals are being ascribed, though it remains challenging. It parallels the struggles we face with Greek hero mythology, as I've noted before, but also with, for example, the Bible, uh, and in particular, the era of the patriarchs. In other words, we're wondering whether all this wasn't simply a later invention to legitimize power and so on. In spite of everything, I've noticed that uh, whether it's the Greek heroes, the Bible or China, we always end up finding archaeological traces of at least the beginnings of something real, on which no doubt stories were later embroidered and told for propaganda and legitimization purposes and so on. There's no question about it, of course. But they are never pure inventions. That seems to be a constant that we can learn from the way history is written. There's always a starting point that seems to be true. Then we have the following map, which must be from the... Shang Dynasty. This is the second of the three dynasties. China was dominated roughly from the 16th to 11th century BC. And here too, it is thought that there was in Henan, which must have been the capital of this civilization from around the 13th century. So uh, Yugi himself tells me, it seems to me that ZH is pronounced J, so should we say cheeks? Maybe, but frankly, tonight I haven't tried to be cynical. I'm not, so I'm pronouncing things in the French way. I pronounce things in the French way, as in the old days. We used to say for Persia, for the Assyrians, Sardar instead of Asurbanipal. It's like that, I assume, let's say I assume for tonight, and may the... forgive me. I use the Jacaron site, which is very good for uh, finding approximate borders over time, uh, very quickly. Now, we're not sure that the Changs controlled the whole of the Great Plain of North China, which is about this area. The area. They may only have controlled part of it and probably had a kind of more or less loose suzerainty over the rest of the area, in much the same way as, for example... The kings of Celtic, Angola, you know, there were tribes, one after the other, Angole, the Biturijes, the Edouans, etc., who more or less presided over the concert of Gallic tribes, but there was never a unified monarchy. I think we were probably in something like that from what we can find as a summary of what the Chang's dynasty must have looked like. 
But what characterizes it is that at this time, the first states and therefore the first cities were developing. In other words, this was the true beginning of civilization in China. Next, the Zhou dynasty emerges, indicating a significant change. Thus, thousand... I... I think it's the 1000 BC I put on for you. It must be this one, which shows the domination of the Zhou dynasty, which dominated more or less the same area. So this is, uh, all this corresponds a little, if you like. If you want to draw a parallel, once again, in the model of what I was saying, to the equivalent of what the old kingdom was for Egypt, i.e. Uh, the beginnings of civilization. You know, if you look at the history of Egypt, Hollywood often gives us the impression that there's a kind of continuity. There's a tendency to systematically show pharaohs building palaces at the same time as pyramids or sphinxes, which makes absolutely no sense, since the great temples like Karnak or Luxor, in other words, the great Egyptian palace temples we know and love, are generally a thousand or fifteen hundred years older than the great pyramids. So it's uh, it's hardly even the same civilization at such great distances, if you like. Uh, that is to say, in one case, we have the construction of tombs that are gigantic mausoleums, which are the pyramids. And in the other case, we have tombs that are essentially dug out of the rock. So it's really two completely different practices. And it's like trying to see the same thing in Greek temples as in Gothic cathedrals. We're not on the same, we're not on the same we're not in the same civilization so there are also evolutions that can go like that but for the shang and zhu we're in the uh, didn't you show me the map uh, milan leo leo i hope he hasn't fainted thank you as you can see the movement of it is quite limited thus the western zoo which we used to refer to occupied this space if we consider the Shang dynasty along with the Zhu, the entire period lasted for around seven to eight hundred years. That's something important, but, but with the fall of the Western Zoo, you have the opening of a period of feudal breakup. Feudal breakup, a fairly quite classic. Sorry, but I see Scuppin making the joke. We've invented the expression to stretch the other zoo, and I'm sorry, it makes me laugh more than it should. It's absurd. It's funny, good joke, I love it. So I don't know if they stretched the other zoo, but in any case, the Western Zoo empire collapsed, uh, as this kind of collapse is often observed. Uh, this collapse occurred around the 8th century BC. That's when it really took effect uh, with the opening of the so-called spring autumn period, which precedes the famous period of the Warring Kingdoms, of which I believe there have been films and also video games. It's something we like. There isn't a total war, a fighting kingdom. I don't know. In any case, it's known and it does resemble our Middle Ages a little, uh, probably more the spring and autumn period for our Middle Ages. And uh, with the period of the, the fighting kingdoms, we're more on something equivalent to the Renaissance, I think, already. That is to say, the reappearance of states. In ancient Greece, during the 5th century BC, things were done similarly to how they were done then, specifically, with these confrontations between states that eventually led to, in the 3rd century BC, uh, the reunification of China. So first, I'm going to show you, I forgot to say, go ahead, play the maps, so you'll see what's there. You have the 700 BC map, which will show you the state of disintegration of the Western Zoo Empire. So you see, it's a breakup, and it's reminiscent of what you see on maps that show uh, the breakup of the Roman Empire, for example, something that's well known historically, I'd like to say, this division, this fragmentation into several feudal entities. And then when we move on to the next map, i.e. 300 BC or thereabouts, you'll see that there are already more extensive groupings. Europe, let's say, in the 19th century, it's a Chinese space characterized by competing entities. Chinese space, which is the same problem faced by all civilization states, as long as they're ahead of their time, I'd say, is that what characterizes them is that they are on a geographical space, which is uh, not a metaphoric. Let me remind you what David Kozande means by this term. It's the term that associates stability and prosperity. In other words, the fact of having stable borders with a multitude of entities. In fact, it's a division that favors prosperity. That's Kozande's idea. So this division has to be stable. I've already done some programs. I think I mentioned it in the program on the Arab world. But I also talk about it regularly when I talk about Europe. The relief in Europe, like the relief in ancient Greece in the days of the cities, 
favors the emergence of states with stable borders, quite simply because you have very obvious natural borders, which make it easy to defend oneself and which create relatively strong and natural cultural or dialectal barriers. This creates stronger local identities, which in turn promotes the stability of states over time, more willpower to defend themselves against their neighbors and more capacity thanks to natural obstacles. We find the same thing on its own scale in Europe, but in an area such as uh, Mesopotamia in very early antiquity, or that which led to the advent of Persia, Syria in the first instance. Egypt, of course, was also a region of very high antiquity where there was no natural geographical division. The best example is Egypt. Since Egypt is essentially the banks of the Nile, there are no natural borders. On the other hand, on the banks of the Nile, there's a great deal of geographical unity which favors political unification. And China, in fact, had the same problem, in quotation marks, on those dimensions in any case, i.e. there were no natural Chinese borders. In China's current dimensions, there are, since it reaches the Himalayas to the south, and to the north, it reaches the Siberian plains, or at least there are rivers or something. So there it was much less clear-cut. So that's another reason why, in this case, rather than having, in a stable way, this Miru Pori that appears, this multiplicity of states of equivalent size, well, you have the tendency to blobber, in fact, the tendency of at least one of the states little by little to take over everything and make the unity of the totality. In China, it was the Qin dynasty. Here again, I don't know if you say Qin, I say Qin, it's as square as an ass, so be it, which is half, well, what you see in orange, the most Western dynasty, which had the advantage of coming from a relatively mountainous area and which has Leo preceded me, who unified this ancient and historic China uh, in... No, but it's very good. It was very good. You can't go back. So you're revisiting the movement that in just a few decades beat its rivals and united China for the first time, of China for the first time. So with Qin Shi Huangdi, who was the great founder of the Chinese empire with Hong Wu, I'll come back to this later, and Xi Jinping. So you have this first unified state, his dynasty didn't last long, he died. Because after him there was a revolt, the Liu Bang revolt, a rebellious warlord of peasant origin who founded the Han dynasty, the great dynasty of antiquity, China's equivalent, if you like, of the Roman Empire, of the future China, which will come from there. So you can move on to the next map, which should show the apogee of the Han Empire of the Han Empire. So we're around 100 AD, which also corresponds to the apogee of the Roman Empire after all, so the two were quite connected. And so it's really the dynasty that stabilizes the empire that takes up a lot of the heritage of the Chinese. So people say if China, I'm going to say China, besides the name comes from there. Yes, I knew that. And uh, uh, and the maximum territorial expansion you see here was under the Wudi Emperor, who was very long lived, reigning from 141 BC. I'm sorry, what's that date? I took my notes wrong. Yes, that's right, 141 BC to 87 BC, but I don't think the empire moved that much, or else I'm getting carried away in my notes. No, that's it. The empire is the one that gave its maximum extension, pardon me, to this empire. He was the most powerful of the dynasty, and as was the case in the Roman Empire, the Chinese imperial power naturally moved towards centralization, even centralism with the emergence of an increasingly important administration, which naturally ended up investigating the country and causing it to collapse in on itself once again around the 4th century. Uh, so I think the next map is about 230, that's it. So the first collapse, the first division happens at that time. Uh, so it doesn't happen all at once, if you like. It's like uh, you shouldn't dwell too much on the names of dynasties are important. But it's like if you like in the Roman Empire. That is, in the Roman Empire, uh, if you just look at a map of uh, who controls what, you might get the impression that it collapsed in the second century if you take a map during the military anarchy. But the fact is that these phenomena have a bit of an accordion effect, i.e. it starts to collapse. Then you have people who manage to reunify or partially reunify. So here you can see the state it was in in 230 BC. The following map will show you what it was like in the year 230 AD. In the year 300 you have in the following map, I don't know if it's displayed because I'm a little out of sync. And uh, so...
first you have this, so I can't even read what's on my pictures. I'm isolated. I displayed them wrong. I displayed them wrong because I didn't know about... Now, that was the Western Jin dynasty. It was during this period of decline of the imperial entity. Then you have the following map in 350, which I've kept for you, which will show you... Is there any way I can enlarge it to see something? Even if I enlarge it, I can't read it. So you have a new division, you see. If we show the next map in 450, you'll see that we're in the same type of dynamic that we saw during the Great Intermediate Period in Egyptian history during the Middle Kingdom. In other words, as you know, there are two great apogees in Egyptian history, the Old Kingdom and the New Kingdom, Les JJ. China is a bit like that, and it's a bit like what we see, uh, as I've just said, at the end of the Roman Empire, i.e. you have declines. But for example, if you look at the Roman Empire in the 4th century, at the end of the 4th century AD, then you take Justinian's empire, where Justinian's empire is naturally a superior splendor. So you still have, roughly speaking, a downward slope, but with upward effects, slow declines. The world map you can put up is 590, please. And in 590, you have uh, uh, the advent of the dynasty. Well, it starts a little earlier. In the 540s, uh, you have the arrival of the Sui dynasty, which is the first in two centuries to reunite the whole of historical China. So things began to get back on track. Um, the Sui dynasty was founded by a man called Yang Jian, who was a general from the Zhou, or the Zhu of the North. Uh, you pronounce it as you like. It's the same continuity. Who... And so what's interesting here is that we find something very Khaldunian in the end from Ibn Khaldun, i.e. Uh, that it's the periphery which has remained more barbaric than the most civilized heart that comes back to restore unity. So there's a touch of Charlemagne, if you like, in the spirit. The Sui dynasty didn't last, last very long, lasting around 30 years under his rule and was succeeded by the Tang dynasty. Here's the big difference with Charlemagne, if you like. The Carolingian Renaissance didn't last long, but the Tang dynasty did. So it's more reminiscent of what was in the continuity of the Roman Empire, perhaps in the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire, the dynasty of, uh, what was it called? I don't remember who was in the dynasty, that of Basilescu. In the 11th century, which restored much of the Byzantine... <laughs> Byzantine power. Uh, the Tangs were also a form of renaissance like that, but went much further than that, in fact, since they managed to achieve a geographical extension that was even greater than what I showed you earlier for the Han Empire. But the dynasty, one of the best known and the one civilization, let's say the first Chinese civilization, if we draw a sort of continuum from the beginning to the present day, reached its apogee, is the Song Dynasty. Uh, I think this is the next map. There's no map in between. Uh, the one from 910, uh, I wanted to show you uh, because in 910, there was still a period at the fall of the Tang Dynasty of Division, uh, as usual again. Uh, but then you have the next map, which is 904, 80, where you have the Song Dynasty, which is established and holds sway for a while. This is the apogee of Chinese civilization, of the first Chinese civilization, the ancient civilization, the civilization before that, because you'll see that there were, in fact, two major phases. I'll come back to this, but it was the Song Dynasty that was the first, for example, to issue banknotes. It was the Song Dynasty that reached the apogee of a number of extremely refined arts, moors, and so on. Quite simply, the problem of the Song Dynasty was that after three centuries of of Blogum Lego that says the Tang Dynasty was stable before it rocked. Tonight you're very good at wordplay. It's been a long time since you've been so hot on the subject. So the Song Dynasty lasted, held the territory like that for three centuries and could in fact have been the starting point uh, of China's national sedimentation, I think because the territory was starting to become extremely stable. It could have been maintained 
uh, in strict continuity until the modern period. I think it would have been possible, but this dynasty was hit firstly by the Jurchen invasion, the invasion of the Jurchen, who were more or less the ancestors of the Manchus, who came from the same region, uh, this northern region. So here you can see the map of the northern region. So here you can see the map of who finally pushed the song back a little to the south. So it looks as if they've lost that it's been a bit catastrophic, but the reality is that the main part of the population of the population and grain production was still located in this southern half of the country. So by moving back like that, they still retained most of the wealth, so to speak, of the Chinese state. But the biggest problem that has arisen in Chinese history, of course, and this you must know, is next map, the arrival of the Mongols. The arrival of the Mongols, which was a real catastrophe, uh, it had similar consequences to what we had observed in Persia half a century earlier. You know that for Persia, the Mongol invasion had been catastrophic. I think I've already talked about it. In particular, because the Mongols had arrived, they had massacred a good part of the population. They had destroyed all the old irrigation systems that had made Persia and its agriculture rich and replaced them with grazing systems more suited to the Mongolian way of life, leading to famines that wiped out a large part of the population. So at the time of the Mongol invasion, just for the conquest of the northern half, which you've seen, the Chinese population dropped by 40% from 112 million to 70 million, and at least 90 cities were destroyed in the process. So it was a really big catastrophe. And from then on, if you like, if you like, it broke the momentum into which the song had succeeded in launching China. And something very important, very important, very important, which is why I was talking about a rupture. It's, I'm going to show you some more cards. It's about to happen. Can you show me the map of China where there's what I've entitled capital? On this map here, you'll see the various capitals in Chinese history. And what's most important you'll see is that the capitals, the capital you see furthest north is Beijing. And in fact, Beijing became the capital after these crises. And so when China regained its independence with the retreat of the Mongols, which we'll talk about shortly, Beijing became the definitive capital and remained China's modern capital. Before that, uh, the other capitals you see were in the south. You had the very old capital Chang'an or Xi'an, you had Lujiang, you had Kaifeng, and there's Nanjing too, which was a capital for a little while. Uh, but what you notice, to come back to what I always say about how nation states are built, is that, that all these capitals were located on the edge of the great North China plain, uh, which you can see quite clearly. And so this brings us back to the idea I've already mentioned many times that the center of power within a nation state is always it's always in the city that dominates or in the space that dominates the Great Plain and China is no exception to this rule but nevertheless we can see that between the first history of, of China let's say and the history of modern China there's been a shift uh, the Great Plain is still the same. There's no change in the Great Plain since there's only one in China. The point that dominates it changes side within the Great Plain of China. And that I think is significant. It's truly indicative of a civilizational break. That's why I was talking to you about this civilizational rupture. We can draw a parallel with, for example, what happened in Europe. I'll show you the capital map of Europe where you had between antiquity and modern times, or extensions of antiquity in the modern era, as it were, the transfer for Western Europe of the old capital of Rome to Europe, it was rather London, which was the capital of the British Empire, which was the hegemonic power worldwide. As for Eastern Europe, it was the heir to orthodox civilization. The first center in antiquity was Constantinople, and that moved to Moscow, which naturally became the new capital of orthodoxy. Another example is the map of Japan I've prepared, showing the transition from Kyoto to Tokyo. And you have to realize that the Great Plain of Tokyo, where Tokyo is located and which Tokyo occupies for the most part today, was a barbarian territory in ancient times, what we might call Japanese antiquity, i.e. during the first uh, millennium. During the first millennium, Japanese civilization was only to the west of that great mountain range you see just west of Tokyo, in fact. And Kyoto was the capital back then, dominating the Great Plain of the time. 
And from the moment the finally colonized the rest of their territory, settled there, and civilization got a foothold there. It was naturally, it was Tokyo that emerged as the true powerhouse, replacing Kyoto and becoming the new center of power, marking a significant transition from one civilization to another. And so uh, to return to China, I think it's in this sense that we can truly consider the Mongol invasions a pivotal moment broke in the history of China because there's this break in continuity in China's political center of gravity, which moves north to Beijing. So the hold on, I'm going to look at the next map I've prepared. So here we were at, so yes, I had shown you the map of the Mongol invasion. Then you have the map of the Mongol invasion. Then you have the map of after that the Mongols had completed the conquest of the whole of China. And from then on, it's the Yuan dynasty, isn't it? Reigns over the country, finally initiating the Sinization of the Mongols' reign since the Mongols conquered China, but in a way that we often see here too. The conquered conquer the conqueror in much the same way as the Romans conquered the Greeks, i.e. local tradition imposes itself on power, even if the power is foreign. So in this case, uh, the UN dynasty, even if it is a Mongol dynasty, dynasty is ultimately a new starting point in the construction of Chinese Chinese identity. I don't understand why my YouTube is having trouble keeping up. Uh, because every time it seems to lag behind. The, ah, but that's because when I move it, it's no longer reading, so it doesn't keep up, okay? That's why I always have the impression that the maps aren't displayed, sorry. So the UN Empire just settles in, but it begins to crumble. In the 14th century, UN Empire, uh, the empire collapsed in the 14th century due to the Red Turban Revolt, an ethnic uprising that is basically the Chinese who were fed up with the Mongols and now want to be ruled by their own dynasty, by a Chinese dynasty. And so this revolt led to a series of battles culminating in Honghu's seizure of power in month 368, marking the beginning of the great Ming dynasty, which was also the starting point for the rebirth of the Chinese state with its first battle against the old feudal system. And so the rebirth of a state, which in my opinion is the starting point of the uh, starting point of the birth of the Chinese nation state, because in the end, with the Mongols and with this revolt, independence revolt of the red turbans against the Mongol Empire. There is an affirmation of identity, which is uh, an embryo of national identity. The Mongols were the earliest example of otherness, first manifestation, the first test of otherness, of power, and above all, of Chinese collective identity. In other words, we really had the presence of a foreign master who aroused national feeling. It's a well-known fact that foreign invaders often foster national sentiment. It happened, it happened to the Spanish under Napoleon and to the Germans at the same time. These things are well known. Uh, so that's the first period. And if you like, there's something that must ring a bell. Here we are in the 14th century on the map we've shown you. And uh, let me remind you that in order to create a fully-fledged nation-state emerging from feudalism, parliamentary nation-state, we'll come back to that later, it takes about 600 years or a little longer. So you understand that uh, when we have the revolution, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you get the idea. When we have the Chinese revolution in 29911, well, clearly that means we've reached the stage of national revolution because it's simply the right time. And it means that for a country the size of China and so far removed culturally from what we saw in Europe, the model is the same and the timescales for the emergence of a nation state are the same. All it takes is another small intellectual effort. We need to somehow evacuate and forget all Chinese history before 14th century for the reasons I've already given, which is that the Mongol invasion created a rupture in the history of this civilization. And so it's not surprising that it's not surprising that this movement of national construction started again from the beginning when the Mongols left, uh, quite simply. But we've seen the same thing in Persia, if you've read what I say about the structure of Persian history, in the same way that despite the long history of the Persian Empire, uh, modern Iran is really starting to build again uh, after having been practically depopulated by the Mongols, starting to build again in the 16th century after having been totally destroyed. So it's not surprising. Surprising. We're really on familiar ground historically, I'd say. We're not going to go into the details of how it was built, 
but you've got the following maps one after the other so you've got this ming empire that's prospering and the next map is the year of the king so there's been a change of dynasty to the king dynasty but that doesn't change much except that if there's one thing that's important and i almost forgot it with the kings it's that the kings are once again the yurkins of the north i.e if you like the manchus for short people who come from manchuria in the north of korea korea in other words the return of a dynasty of a dynasty that's a bit foreign though not as foreign as the mongols if you like so it's as if i don't know as if france had been governed by germans but it's not as if france had been governed by chinese or by turks let's say by turks uh, to stick with a local equivalent so we're not in the same opposition but nevertheless despite everything this impression that there's a difference in identity will once again be expressed since when we reach the year of the chinese revolution in our timeline there will once again be a small ethnic element of refusal of the foreign dynasty of refusal of the turks saying that they are manchus that they are not chinese that they must be kicked out and here's another interesting point if you think about it we've been through this even in france because when you read qu'est ce que le tiers état by bcis what do you see you have this famous discourse on the fact that the entire ruling aristocracy in france the people we know as gallo romans today are the descendants of the ancient gallic and roman populations who intermingled and formed a unique gallo roman culture this idea frequently arises in national revolutions justifying the people's seizure of power as they strive to be the ones in control always or will try to give a slightly different identity or at least if there's an element that creates an identity gap between the elites and the people to justify all the more getting rid of the elites the revolution is bound to go that way and so it's a parallel we'll find too facilitated by the fact that this dynasty of kings was born from abroad nevertheless the king empire is powerful the king empire expands so this is in the year of the king and you have the following map from the year of the king which shows a further expansion and finally you have the map from the year of the king which shows what was ultimately china's territorial apogee which was as you can see possessing extending along the entire coast north of korea a territory that would later be taken from them by the russians at the time uh, china dominated the whole area towards tibet but a little further into central asia than where it is now and also dominated the territory of mongolia so this was truly the territorial apogee of the chinese and it was also in the same century uh, what should ultimately have been the apogee of the kings and the chinese you have the arrival of the otherness of the russian empire to the north uh, the british empire to the south and the deputy of the french and that's when you have the opium wars the boxer war a whole host of conflicts that will deeply humiliate this chinese regime and will at once remanifest this great otherness and make china feel that it is no longer the middle kingdom that reigns over half the world but it is a state and a nation confronted with other very powerful imperial states of equal or even greater capacity destroying imperial palace during the opium war the french were there will remember and it wasn't the best thing we did in the 19th century uh, as much as the crimean war was justified the opium war was a bit average uh, but there you have it a major humiliation for china at the same time as you had with the conclusion of the unequal treaties by which in fact the westerners were making colonial type treaties quite simply with china and skinning it completely undoubtedly japan's ability to shield itself from these influences can be attributed to the close proximity of china westerners were so captivated by the allure of china that japan was subsequently left considerably isolated it is plausible to suggest that it would have been considerably more manageable for japan had we not also been preoccupied with devoted efforts towards china so after this phase of expansionist effort by the qing you have these humiliations that arrive foreign wars you have the ruin of course that this entails so you have as i was saying wars against the west but you also have wars against japan with the first sino japanese war and it was at this point that they lost taiwan and lost korea so korea wasn't uh, it wasn't part of the territory but they were suzerains of korea more or less so they lost it 
And so it was even more humiliating, if you like, to, to lose to Japan because Japan had been considered an inferior state uh, by China for a very long time. Uh, it was a kind of periphery. And if you look at the history of Japan, for a long time, Japan imported its culture, elements of its culture from China because it was really the cultural center of the time. And so there were attempts at reform by the imperial monarchy, which failed. And you have all this which eventually led, and I'll do this quite quickly, to Denis de la Colère's revolution, which quite clearly is a national revolution, a national revolution of the same type as we've seen in all the other cases of national revolutions I've dealt with, i.e. you arrive at a point where the state is both delegitimized and ruined by the and where you have a middle class, or at least a Chinese merchant class, which was developing despite everything, because there were also advantages to the arrival of Westerners, so there was also trade. These people wanted to invest in China's industrialization, and that's why they didn't like the unequal treaties, because they felt they were preventing them from taking any protectionist measures, taking protectionist measures and following the example of Japan in order to foster development. This led to the collapse of the imperial regime and the start of the Chinese national revolution. Revolution. I won't delve into the extensive account of the Chinese National Revolution, which will be thoroughly addressed in my upcoming book on Rovenshard's empresses. However, I will touch upon its essence here, namely the fundamental characteristic of states lacking traditional assemblies, whereby one would be established just prior to the revolution's commencement. 1919. Uh, the principle of constitutional monarchy had been accepted in 1908. Uh, from that point of view, the revolution was quite similar to what we saw at the same time in Turkey, for example. It's exactly the same years, starting around 1988, the Young Turks Revolution. So we're on the same, same rhythm, the same class, we'll say, uh, in the sense of an age class, the same class of states arriving at the national revolution at the same time, and with all the usual problems of a national revolution, i.e. the gradual plunge into civil war and weakening, and then the takeover of all this by an authoritarian military power, which was or should have been Chiang Kai-shek's Chiang Kai-shek who should have been the revanchist Chinese imperialist since he had successfully regained control of Chinese land in the early 1930s. He'd managed to beat the communists who were practically defeated, so all he had to do was finish them off. And probably once he'd finished them off, he'd set about reconquering the peripheral space that had been lost, i.e. probably Mongolia, lost Tibet, etc. Except that what happened at that time, and Leo has already shown you the map, was the Japanese invasions, which I've already mentioned. I've mentioned it in past several times, but now that you've got the whole history of China, you'll understand where it came from. The Japanese invasion, which was also Japan itself in a state of vengeful imperialism at the time, the Japanese invasion that prevented China from continuing its normal course and put it in a position to be invaded and have to fight by being attacked, i.e. not by giving its revenge imperialism outwards, but by being attacked internally. As a result, just like Stalin's USSR, instead of doing what it should have done, i.e. embarking on external conquest or reconquest, provoke a coalition of its neighbors against it, and then finally being brought back within borders, which could have become identity building, because it can't get out, because it loses the war, and has to resign itself to what its neighbors have imposed on it. And at that point, there would have been a transition Chinese parliamentary just as it happened in Japan, uh, except that it happened in Japan after the defeat of two of those 45. If the Chinese in Chiang Kai-shek's channels hadn't had Japan's USSR to contend with, if Japan hadn't existed, Chiang Kai-shek would have launched his revenge he imperialism. He would have faced a coalition comprised of Russians, Europeans and Americans who would likely have defeated him. That China would have been put back within its borders and would have become a parliamentary state from the outset, just as Japan did in its history. But it didn't happen because, as in the case of Stalin's USSR, China ended the war on the winning side. In the end, they ended up victorious, but the exhaustion ran deep. No one was inclined to engage in a war with China as long as it pursued expansionist ambitions. As a consequence, China could not afford to continue its expansionist endeavors, its internal war. One thing that had changed was that Chiang Kai-shek had been somewhat discredited by the duration of the war. On the other hand, Mao's communists had the wind in their sails because they'd taken advantage of the war to remake themselves. Plus, they were supported by the Soviets and Manchukuo, which had been invaded by the Soviets at the end of the war. Of the war, 
could now serve as a rear base for the communists, giving them a considerable strategic advantage. Advantage, And so you had the gradual withdrawal over several years of the Chinese multinationals behind Chiang Kai-shek to the island of Taiwan. And in the year of the Chinese Communist Republic of China, in the year of the Chinese Communist Mao Republic Zedong of China... Mao Zedong was able to proclaim the advent of the People's Republic of China. And Mao, though normally no longer a revenge imperative somehow did what Chiang Kai-shek would have done, except that he didn't do it in the initial movement that would have prompted a coalition of neighbors against him. He did it by being among the victors of the Second World War on the one hand, on the other by being in the blind spot or uh, in the shadow or in the wake of the Cold War, conflict that had developed between the Russians, Russians and Americans, which gave him the strategic space to do what he wanted to do. And what did he do? He did what Chiang Kai-shek would have done if he hadn't, which was to reinvade Tibet. He also took back Xinjiang, which Chiang Kai-shek had already done. And finally, Mao took back Tibet. In a way, Mao re-established Chinese suzerainty over part of Korea by taking part in the war in North Korea. The war in North Korea did involve the Chinese fighting the Americans. You have to realize that, except that now we find ourselves in the same situation. And uh, there was also a war against the Soviets, since there was the X-969 war on the Amur River, which still left around 20,000 dead, uh, so it wasn't huge, but between nuclear powers it was still important. There won't be another nuclear war. It's still a war, but it meant that China finished asserting itself, except that instead of having an imperium of which was installed old. It was Mao's. And so just as with Stalin's, the imperial phase, restart the imperial phase, which should bring at the end of the trajectory to a new national revolution. Uh, we have a Chinese regime today that is comparable to that of the USSR, which is comparable to what the German Empire was in Viti Fortifi, i.e. an empire that existed some 40 years after its founder had finished setting it up. Mao was, let's say, in ex fee that it came to a standstill since the Sino Indian War, which led to uh, the conquest of Aksa China, took place in Pati Seventh, and the war against the Soviets, uh, which I mentioned in Tasishik, so it was in these waters, if you like. Consequently, Korea. Korea was before in BT Wait, and so Mao died in Zixentin, and so we're about 40 years after that, a little more, but it's always that order of duration, and. Uh, the imperial regime is already aging. It's not a new regime, the Chinese regime. It's an aging imperial regime, which uh, is exposed to undergo what this kind of regime undergoes, i.e. Uh, the fact of trying to launch a war that will finally enable it to achieve the hegemony it had hoped for, only for this war to prove disastrous, leading to the regime's collapse in on itself. Once again, whether it's the end of the USSR in Gesinatnai or the end of the German Empire in Natna Propinsiwait, it's the same type of internal collapse after a humiliating conflict. So for me, this is clearly where we're heading because this is what's being announced both by the fact that there's a Chinese national revolution and by the fact that we're in the midst of a reboot, a restart. A reboot similar to that of the USSR, uh, starting from the end of Mao's reign, let's say, since it was Mao's reign that ultimately constituted a kind of foundation for a new empire, Mao's empire, a Chinese empire reconstituted by Mao over Tibet, etc. And this Chinese empire is now aging through its regime, but it still has higher ambitions than the German empire or the USSR, which was to end up becoming the world's leading legal power, or at least the world's first legal power. And this exposes uh, the Chinese regime today to the risk of entering a war that would cost it its regime. The Chinese regime is already expansionist and hegemonic in its near abroad. You have the last map I gave you, Leo, which you can show, which is the map of the South China Sea, you know, the whole area in which the Chinese have almost annexed the sea, uh, since in the Spratly and Paracel Islands, they've turned them into solid land, almost into immobile aircraft carriers to seize a whole bunch of sectors, which naturally, in a movement that naturally excites the anger of Vietnam, the Philippines and Malaysia, feel threatened, feel robbed. And uh, lately, if you've been following the news bulletins, I've been regularly talking about the difficulties faced by the Philippines, for example, in preventing them from supplying some of their islands, etc., precisely by intimidation. And it is in this area that the Americans maintain what they call freedom of navigation operations, i.e. they keep their armed ships on the move. 
to assert that they still have the right to circulate, that this is not a Chinese privatization. But Chinese imperialism exists on that side. It also exists on the Himalayan side. I've talked about it many times, and I refer you to previous programs on China uh, with Indian armies since the end of the war at regular intervals with various confrontations and sometimes even deaths, as in June of the war, which show a significant certainty on the part of China. One border conflict will ultimately lead to the downfall of Chinese rule, having the same effect as China itself. It will have the same effect as Afghanistan for the USSR or the war of Kutsa for the German Empire. It appears increasingly probable that China is heading towards a scenario like this. This is evident because China is currently on the verge of emerging from its previous position and strive to become a leading global power aiming to surpass the United States economically. However, since the 1990s, its share of the world's population has declined. In the 90s, its share of the world economy has increased almost tenfold, i.e. in the 90s, China's share of the world economy was 2%, and in 2021, it had risen to 18.4%, but fell back to 17%. In 2000. 22, the largest decrease in two years since the 1960s. China's decline in the world economy. This means that even if Chinese companies sometimes remain in business, a good part of China's so-called workshop of the world activity is being relocated to India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, or neighboring countries because labor is cheaper, but also because of the problems of the global economy. As you probably know, experts predict that by the end of the 21st century, uh, China's population will decline by roughly 50%, amounting to a significant decrease. Between 2000 and 2000 and 2003, the world economy's expected growth of $8,000 billion did not include China. Countries like the United States and other emerging countries account for all this growth. The United States accounts for 40% of this global growth and the other emerging countries for 50%, according to an article in Foreign Policy that I was able to consult. So these are truly considerable sums. And half of the emerging countries' gains come from five countries, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Brazil, and Poland. And Poland, which means it's uh, reorienting, if you like, all these issues we're talking about, BRICS and so on. China is significantly downgraded within this group, uh, which is of great importance. Many signals indicate China's decline compared to the rest of the world, the relative decline of China compared to what it had managed to become, and uh, fundamental data such as the economy, the cost of labor in China, or above all demographics, do not allow us to foresee an improvement in these factors, uh, of these factors. So uh, in reality, we're already seeing a decline in China, uh, accelerated by the tightening of the screws of an aging regime, particularly since uh, Xi Jinping became president in 2012, which means he's been in power for over 10 years now and has now established himself as a dictator for life. The sclerosis of the Chinese system and condemns it to collapse probably within the next 10 years or so, as is usually the case historically in this type of models. And the good news is that normally China's democratization should be at least timeless, but it's not at all impossible possible to see to see i'm just wondering what kind of face it could have given the aging conditions of the Chinese population. But after all, we've seen that the total difference in demographics between the Soviet Union and Russia, Russia is demographically half the size of the Soviet Union, doesn't prevent Putin's revanchist imperialism. Given that the collapse of the regime will plunge China into a new uh, national revolution, since this won't be like Japan in 2012, we won't be in a defeat on the way out of revenge imperialism, we're in a reboot. So we've started from the beginning and so it'll be a new national revolution and a new national revolution means a new revenge imperialism and so we may have a Chinese revenge imperialism uh, within the next 30 years or so uh, it's not at all impossible but the big question as I said is what it will be like in terms of Chinese demographics at that time but by then we may have had some technological solutions to this kind of problem i.e. Uh, we may have very aging societies that will be able to give us an imperialism that's more or less the same aging societies which could give give rise to a vengeful imperialism, notably because we may be fighting essentially by drone, etc. Uh, and uh, the human factor will be less important uh, militarily. And so uh, in such a hypothesis, we might think that robotics could compensate for the absence of youth and thus enable the normal historianomic movement, return of imperialism.
revenge. Uh, that's where China's heading, I think. Uh, in any case, we'll have to think about it at a later date. Uh, and I think that in 10 years' time, I'll still be here to try and think about it. And that will be one of the major elements that will put an end to the global geostrategic confrontation that began between Russia and NATO in February last year. Last year, my vision of the conflict.